You are listening to episode 7 of Cocktails and Chat. Are you a maker running your own handmade business? Do you love it, but sometimes wish you could go out for drinks with colleagues? If so, then you're in the right place. In this podcast, you'll get to meet a maker on each episode over a cocktail or mocktail. You'll hear about the challenges and joys of running your own business, and you'll learn about many different kinds of making. Just attempt your creative muscles. Mostly, you'll learn that you're in great company as a maker, solopreneur. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Slocum. I provide bookkeeping for makers and artisans. In this series, the spotlight's on having fun and getting to know each other. So relax and join us. So welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for joining, for, for agreeing to come on. Um, I am so stoked to meet you. You are miles and miles away. <laughs> in, in a different uh, time, what we would have met somewhere locally, wouldn't we? We would have, yes. Um, we are both in Glossop, Derbyshire, uh, near the Peak District. But um, Jacqueline is in her home on her so- on one side of town, and I am on another side of town. And um, yes, anyways, we we I I found your work through a mutual friend. It was when I started my business, when I got serious about it, wanted a logo, and I asked around for if anybody knew any graphic designers. And a friend of ours suggested you. Uh, and I had a look at your work in. It wasn't right for my business, but I absolutely love it personally. Um, so in my personal stationery, it has, um, it, it is just great. I, I love the the floral, the, the prettiness. The, I love stationery. I love sending postal mail. I love sending cards and letters and things. So this is like my dream interview right now. So I'm just so stoked to have you on. Thank you. In my house, we we refer to you as my number one fan because I've taken so many things to your house. My my (laughs) husband knows where you live because he he delivers all these things to you. Um, I I really love your branding, by the way. I really (laughs) admire it. I don't know who did it, but I, I really like it. I, I would recommend her, except that she is so busy with the full-time gig now that I, I don't think she has time anymore. But, yes, so I got really lucky with that. But, um, anyways, so uh, this is Jacqueline from Paper Willow. She creates nature-inspired stationery, including wedding stationery. So tell us, Jacqueline, um, how did you get started, and, and what do you do that I left off that little brief snippet? Um. I started it about 10 years ago when a friend of mine asked me to design her wedding stationery and I just completed a graphic design course and was looking for things to do so I designed stationery that was it, the venue that she was getting married in had all these um Chinese blue vases you know the black uh, blue and white patterned vases they were very beautiful so she wanted all her stationery to match um and that's that's the first thing I did and it it was successful and it, it came out well um and that started me off on whether this was possible to make a proper business out of it um I'm just going to get my drink I can see you've got your cup let's get mine um but before that, I'd worked for um, Star Cutouts in Ashton. Have you heard of Star Cutouts? When I read your LinkedIn profile, I had. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They're a really interesting company. Um, they were started by some friends of mine about close to 20 years ago now, which is really horrifying. We're getting close to 20 years ago. Um, but... I, in 2008, um, I stopped teaching because I lost my voice. Um, And my friends at Star Cutouts gave me a job doing admin. And then I started working in the manufacturing side and learning about that. And then I started taking on design work that was quite simple design work, but I found that I was quite good at that. Um, 
so I kind of made that my own and became the design manager there. Um, but after a while, I got a bit bored with it. It wasn't all that creative. So I I went to a college in Manchester called Shillington. I don't know if you've heard of Shillington College. Um, they do intensive graphic design courses. So for, you do a three month period where they work you to the bone. They start you at eight o'clock in the morning and you work so hard. Um, and that taught me the basics of graphic design and using the computer programs. But then after that, I needed I needed a job. I needed something to do. So that's that was the beginning of wedding stationery. It was it was something to do to earn money, basically. Um, does that answer that question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so. Yeah, and, and you got started with your, your friend asking you, and then you, you just saw the gap in the market. I love how you do that. Um, so I found you well after my own wedding. But I, I love that idea that you do of um, customizing the wedding stationery based on the venue. And oh, yeah. Putting the venue into the stationery sometimes and, and all of that. So what does – if I were to um, – and I may still commission you to make some stationery for me. What does that process look like on your end? What, what, how, how does a card, what happens to get a card through my door? Yeah, you asked me this when I posted the um, thing about the factory program. Um, it's a really good question. I, I loved that program on the BBC. I thought it was brilliant, especially that the, the woman's design table looked just like mine. Um, so, the stuff that I do that's part of my collection that's available like like that, that I can edit to somebody's specification, um, all of the elements, all of the, the flowers in it, like the animals and things, um, I drew them separately. Um, and I, well, back at the beginning, I used to draw them on with pen and paper and use real paint on paper. But in the past few years, I've moved entirely on to Procreate. Do you know what Procreate is? No. Not heard of that. It's, um, I can't show you because my phone is currently propped up on my iPad, but it's a, it's a program on iPads um, that allows you to paint with a pencil. And it's phenomenally accurate and so realistic. It, and it, it speeds up the process massively from from pen and paper and paint to to doing it on a screen um but the the process is essentially the same that i start with sketches and i i take a lot of photographs and i look at a lot of photographs i spend a lot of time doing image searches and compiling banks of flowers that so that this one the the tropical i've got folders and folders of pictures of tropical flowers to use as reference pictures. Um, so I start by doing very loose sketching and then better sketching when I start thinking, well, that's what this sort of flower looks like and it'll be useful if it's in that shape because I'll be able to, to put it in a curved place. So I'll draw nicer pictures in pencil on Procreate like that. And then I'll paint them on Procreate um, as if they were real watercolours, but I, I make sure they're all separate. So I've got individual flowers that are not stuck together, you know what I mean? And then I export those into Photoshop on a desktop um, and I neatly make sure they're all nice and neat all around the edges and I put them into their own layers um, so that I can then put them into more files to create the shapes that I want. So this one, the, yeah, the, so graphic, here. Yeah. Yeah. I've, the, the graphic has been created in Photoshop where I've pulled the bits in and turned them how I want them to be. And, and then I put those graphics into another program called InDesign, um, which is how you lay out uh, text um, for print. It's, most graphic designers use InDesign. Um, and if, if I want to tweak the 
graphics, I can go back into Photoshop and just nudge something and save it. And then in InDesign, it goes, you've changed this, do you want me to update it? And it updates and it's, it's really clever. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I, that's how I make the, the graphics. They're all, all separate. Um, and that means that I can make everything that you need to match from those original graphics. Um, and then I print them myself on, on the printer. <laughs> there. there we go. There's the printer. <laughs> Um, does, that, does that answer the question? <laughs> that's all great, thanks. So yeah, this is how, when I first reached out to you, you had a, a wedding uh, card that was autumnal, and yeah. I said, could you please just change that wording where it says happy wedding, or maybe it said thank you or something, to um, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I got my very first Thanksgiving cards. I bought my very first Thanksgiving cards in over a decade. And I was so, so thrilled. I just have no idea. The combination of, um, I love stationery, but Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. And yes, so that's... Yeah, that, um, I, re I remember that, that design very well. Yeah, that, that was a, a version of the woodland design that I'd loads of customers had said to me we really like the woodland design but we're getting married in october so could you add some things and using this method it means i can go yeah i can draw some pumpkins and some berries and 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 then you can adapt things and and say yes to people <laughs> um yeah, yeah and and you don't have to make a whole new design from scratch that's every it time. So yeah it brings so it makes it much more affordable for random people like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too yeah. affordable. Yeah. There we are. Um, <laughs> so, um, what what is a common myth about your field about graphic design? Um, I was chatting to my husband about this before. Um, I I struggled to think of anything, but he thought of something. He was saying. The biggest myth is that graphic designers need to have a, an Apple computer, you know, an Apple Mac. But when I first started, I'd been trained on apples and at Shillington. So I thought that was that was we had to have one. And my husband, who is a software engineer and can build computers, was saying it's insane that you, you're insisting on buying this expensive machine when I can build you a much more powerful machine that if it breaks, if something goes wrong, we can just go in and fix it. And he convinced me that we could get a much longer lasting, powerful machine that he could tweak to my requirements. Um, and he was completely right. And I don't, I don't need an Apple Mac. It's not true that you have to have an Apple Mac. Um, so that's that's the myth that we thought of. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and he is my soul mate, I can tell, on this issue, because <laughs> that's exactly how I think about it. I, I was raised on Apple Mac, um, and my first computer was an Apple Mac. And then yeah. when it um, a capacitor went on the motherboard, and so it just needed a new capacitor. But I took it to the Apple store, and they said, oh, no, we don't have capacitors, and we don't have motherboards. You need a whole new computer. And I was like, oh, wow. No, I, put it, I paid a lot of money for this. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, no, I uh, went off Apple's that day. It's it's completely right. And he's, he's right that we... We have replaced my original computer since then, but we were able to retain huge amounts of the original computer and not have to spend as much money when we replaced it. But having said that, I do have an iPad um, to do the Procreate on and the the um, pencil, the Apple Pencil is really good and really important <laughs> to what I do. So I'm not dissing all Apple products, but you know. <laughs> yeah. But there's a difference between investing in a high-end enough yes. machine to do yeah. what you need to do and just getting an, app, uh, an iPad and a pencil. So, yeah. Um, I can't believe I forgot to ask at the beginning, but what are you drinking tonight? Oh, um, raspberry mojito. Oh, I thought we were drinking blood orange mimosa. But... I have got that one as well, but I, I didn't open it. It's over there. <laughs> I, I'll have that um, one when I finish this one. Maybe a bit later. <laughs> when you asked me to choose a cocktail my original thought was my favorite cocktail is a white russian and then i thought no <laughs> not going to be doing that <laughs> mm. 
Ah, oh, fair enough. But yes, I'm on raspberry. It tastes a little bit like um, cough syrup. <laughs> This, oh no! I probably should have picked the orange one. So oh, I'll run no. quick and move on to the orange. <laughs> well, I finished with the orange, and then the right taste will be in your mouth, right? Yeah. <laughs> what What are your favorite drinks? Um, I I drink wine quite a lot in the evenings. I I like Shiraz and Pinot Grigio, but I I, I drink coffee and. <laughs> Yeah, coffee and wine, pretty much. <laughs> um, are you are you a coffee fan? No, I'm not. Um, I I can't um, take the smell of it. But I know that um, my dad's favorite is Kona coffee, which comes from Hawaii. Have, oh wow! Have no, I've never had that. Have an essential kind of coffee ever? <sighs> not really. No, I I I make real coffee. I do. I don't have instant at all. I've been on the real thing for a long time, but I've, I don't think I've ever had anything really special, but maybe that's oh. something I should look into. <laughs> now I know what to get you for Christmas. <laughs> um, so have you always wanted to run your own business? Um, yes and no. I, thinking back to being a child, I did a lot of making things. Like if you were to ask my dad, he would tell you that I was just always making something and would be up late at night, long after they told me to stop, still fiddling with something and making something. And I do remember inventing brands for myself. And I remember doing something that I called the House of Jacqueline and I had purses that I'd made and things. And there was obviously something there was obviously something there, but then I went to university and did psychology and then I became a teacher. Um, so it, it took quite a while before I realised that actually running a business was the right thing. And I, I think it was working for Star Cutouts. I think it was working for a very small business where I was so involved with every aspect of the business. And I learned a vast amount there about how to do it that I realised that's what I wanted to do. That, you know, I, I like controlling every aspect of of the job and not just doing one little thing. Um, and I, that's what I got to do at Style Cut Outs. Um, you run your own business, don't you? Do you feel the same? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I, I love having the power to say yes or no. I yeah. love having the knowledge of why I have to do certain processes or yeah. whatever. So one of the things in employment that always annoyed me, and because I, I, I never did work for a really small business where maybe it would have been different, but um, was that being able to, you know, saying, why are we doing this thing? It doesn't make sense. And now... Now I have to abide the regulations and work out my policies yeah. myself so that I know if I'm, a, if I'm doing a thing, I know why I'm doing the thing that doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> the law underlying it doesn't make sense. But now I know that, you know, nobody in employment, nobody ever knows that. They're just like, well, this is what we have to do. This is yeah. what so-and-so does. And so you go and ask so-and-so and they don't know. They say, well, it's because it's in our policy. And, and it was very, very frustrating. And, also that um, I worked customer service for many, many years and in smaller places, I, I had a lot of autonomy and, and power to say yes to customers for whatever it was that um, for, you know, if I could deliver it, then I could do it. And then in larger places, there was the real frustration that, oh no, we don't want them to get used to that level of service because not everybody's going to give it to them. So you can't do that. Even though, yes, you could, you yeah. can and and that was very frustrating so yes i, I have i i am greatly appreciative for the self-employment route so i can say yes to customers and or say no yeah no. or say no yeah that too <laughs> and, and you the find there were things decisions that were being made that i didn't agree with or i couldn't see why they were being done and yeah it's the same thing really that 
now I, I get to make that call and I take responsibility if I've made the wrong call and it's, you know, it's my fault if it goes right and it's my fault if it goes wrong. Um, and I, I found it very frustrating working for someone else that sometimes I could see that the wrong decision was being made but couldn't do anything about it and just had to to cope. And even more know. frustrating, it then gets blamed on you anyway. Yeah, so. yeah. When, when you can see a bad decision is being made and there is going to be a long-term impact that's going to hit you and everyone else. When you're working for yourself, you tend to get things right because you're the one who's going to have to to deal with it if it, if it doesn't work. But that's probably a related question, isn't it? Go on. <laughs> that's fine. We're here to have a chat. Have a chat. I know. Have talk, have I know. Business and stationery. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you come up with the idea to focus on making nature inspired stationery because I, I looked at some of your earlier work and you didn't always have that focus so it's no it's over time which earlier work did you see the very beginning of your instagram feed <laughs> i don't I can't even remember what that is what's at the beginning well, you had you had some stripes and you had some polka dots um yeah like and the color palette was very different. But I should go back and have a look. I should, I should go back and... I, I, when I th I've thought about the beginning, and I've even found some of the very first things, um, the, after I did Paula's wedding, and I did my own wedding, um, I then designed a, um, a card that was a, a circle of flowers with really naive writing um, on printed to craft card. And I, I designed it just to, just to see whether I could print it. It was to test the printer and to see what does an invitation look like. And the, the drawings were just done with a pen by hand. And it looked really naive and really cliched, I thought, from the things I'd seen. Um, and I showed it to my friend Paula, who described it as vintage hipster shit. So it became known as the VHS design. And I was like, well, it's not real. I'm not really going to sell this because it's so, it's so cliched. Anyway, that was how I won the first award because I did decide to sell it. And it sold brilliantly for years. And that, that was kind of the beginning of drawing flowers and plants I find it quite easy. There are some things I find really hard to draw. I, I really struggle with people or yeah, people vehicles or <laughs> what was that? People are hard. Yeah, they you really get, are. You get the proportions very slightly wrong in the end of the That's it. That's it. You have to spend so long on them and it's it's so unforgiving. But plants and flowers is my my style has always been very free i'm not very neat when i draw um going back to when i did a level art i was quite messy with my planning and my style was quite loose um and you can do that with with animals and plants and flowers um but yeah the, the vintage hipster shit design which paula named not me um <laughs> It, it was very cliched and there was a lot of it on, on Etsy like that. And I felt it wasn't original at all, but it was a test to see would that sell. Um, and that after a while, I got frustrated with it because I didn't feel it was really that good as I'd done it almost as a joke. And I, I started wanting to draw better flowers and plants and... That the, the next design was the woodland walk design, which was just black on craft. Um, and I remember the first person who bought it. Um, and I remember how excited I was that someone had bought my first proper design that was toadstools and stumps of wood and foxgloves, just, just pen and ink, no colour. Um, that I, I felt I was going to move away from that original rubbish design and move into better quality illustrations and 
I started to realize there was a market for people who wanted nice illustrations that they there were lots of people who didn't want the cliched stuff that you see on it see that they wanted something that was more considered and more hand-drawn um so yeah there were various designs the, the woodland design which has been through about four versions now because every few years i i redesign everything um when i after a few years, I hate the look of something and I go back to the drawing board and do it again with the skills that I have now. Um, so that that woodland walk design I've long since abandoned. You might be able to find it on Pinterest somewhere. Um, but I, th I think I think we're on version four now, possibly even version five. Um, but I've, I've forgotten what I was supposed to be talking about. What was the question? Um, I how did I? Was it about how I chose nature as the? Yeah, yeah. How that, you... Yeah, it's so it's it, it's also my own personal choice of I like that. That's my house is decorated that that way, and the things I choose to to wear and put on the walls. I I like flowers and plants and. I spend a lot of time walking around parks and forests, photographing the flowers and the shapes. And I, I, I photograph thousands of things and then forget that I have them and then find them months later and think, oh, that would just, just go in, in something. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, it's a reflection of, of uh, my own taste, I think. Sorry, my watch is going off. No worries. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about the, how your how style evolves over time. So I am not an artist. I make no profession, no no claim ever on really being able to make any art. But um, I have seen some designers of different sorts almost um, apologetically apologizing for not having a really set style so you have a style now you have this nature inspired you know I can see some of your work and know that it's yours um but you're it's evolved over time and I I think it must be natural to let a style a design style emerge gradually um what what do you think about this do you 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 are right. You, you, you spot on. <laughs> it is true. And it, I mean, that, the only formal art training I've had was A level art. Um, and just before the pandemic, I was doing an art class um, at the Adult Centre in Glossop. Um, I was going to Thursday night art sessions um, and I was learning more formal training of how to do watercolours, how to do oil paints, how to do charcoal and pen and ink. And that's the first proper art training I've had since I was 18, because I didn't go to university to do it. And I, I regret that I didn't go to university and do art. But um, when you look back at what I did at A-level, artists do, they do change, they do you're always sort of picking up things from other people and you're always criticizing what you did before. So like when I look back at the very early designs I did for the business, I think they're rubbish <laughs> and I don't like the way I've drawn something and the, the techniques I use were rubbish. And, and yet some of them sold very well. So. And, they, and I still get requests for them. And I, I think my view of what I'm doing is not necessarily reflective of what of what the audience sees. Um, but I, a, a friend of mine at, at school when I was picking up my little boy, she said to me that she really loved the stuff I was doing and that she could see that in the past two years I've come on a lot. That's because of lockdown, because of all the hours doing nothing where I was drawing on the tablet with no work to do. Um, but I was saying to her, I follow people on Instagram 
who are much, much better than me. Um, and I aspire to them. I look at the techniques they're using and I look at the way they're painting and I think I need to try that. So I watch watercolorists on Instagram, you know, people post videos and I think my watercolors are not good enough. And I go back and and try and copy the same techniques to improve what I'm doing. And I think that most artists are like that, that you never, you're never happy with it. You're happy with it when you, when you launch it, but then a few months later you've changed and you, you change incredibly rapidly, I think. Um, I know I'm not being very succinct. <laughs> um, yeah. Does that answer the question? You, you are you are right, and I don't I don't think that artists ever completely get fixed, and they're never particularly happy with their own work. Even if everybody else is, they can see that there's someone better than them, and that they need their skill to be better. So if you ask me again in another ten years, it will be far different to what I'm producing now. I think. Um. And I'm sure I would love it then, too. Um, I wanted to ask you, you touched on um, awards earlier, and uh, this is a process I've not been through, and, and many makers haven't. But you've won multiple awards. You won the Best New Stationery Company from Hitch.co.uk uh, in 2014, and the Best Stationery Company from County Brides Northwest Wedding Awards in 2015. So did those help your business? What was it like flying? What was the process well, like? It was right at the beginning of the business. It, so I'd only been around for a year or so. Um, so the Hitched Award was for, for the new stationer. Um, and that, I mean, these days I would only be able to apply for awards that you have to pay to, to take part in. Whereas those two awards were both free. So as a new business to enter a free award scheme is a no brainer really. And they were both quite, quite straightforward. You just had to, I think the hitch one, I had to submit pictures and people just voted. So it was just a, people voted on the internet. Um, I can't comment on what the bigger awards are like. So I haven't applied for anything else since then because they all cost money and, that kind of, I don't know whether I really like that. <laughs> I found one recent, oh no, I think the deadline was the 28th, but I, I posted about one recently that doesn't cost any money and doesn't- Oh, I need to look at that. But um, I think the deadline's just passed for this oh, year, wow. but it will be happening next year, so. Oh, I'll yeah. keep an eye on it, but like yeah, but they, did, they did make a difference. Part, partly in, you know, when you start a business, there's a, a huge sense of um, imposter syndrome that you, you're always doubtful whether this is just a fluke that you're managing to sell things and it's going to stop eventually. And whenever you hit a quiet period, you think it's over. No one wants my stuff anymore. But the, the two awards really helped. They helped my confidence of even if I'm not that certain about what I'm doing, and even if it doesn't appeal to everybody, it must appeal to somebody because somebody has voted for them. And it it gave me, what's the word? I, I feel like I had some, some status to be able to put them on the website. And I felt that customers who saw them would hopefully think she must be real if, if she's winning awards that what she's producing must be okay to be winning awards um so it it helped me move up from a absolute beginner business to a fairly established business if you know what i mean and it was it was fun i mean the, the first one i got to go to a meal at the savoy in london and it was fabulous and we got really drunk in the center of london and and i met all these wonderful people and turning up to the savoy and being greeted with champagne it was it was amazing it was you know when i was a teacher that would never have happened to me but for that to happen to me as a as a business owner it was fabulous and the second one, 
um, I was heavily pregnant when I won that award and they kept ringing me asking me would I come to the award ceremony and they wouldn't tell me why obviously they knew that I was the winner and I was I had really bad morning sickness I, I was I don't want to put anyone off their food but I was vomiting all day long and I kept saying to them I just can't I can't travel to Liverpool I can't sit still I can't eat anything I have to just lie down and it's not going away and it, it just went on for weeks and weeks and weeks so I, I didn't actually get to go to the award ceremony to receive that at the it was at the um you know the is it St George's Hall in Liverpool um but I, it was it was a shame that I didn't actually get to receive it in person but there you go um well you have the memories of the first yeah. one, and you yeah. have the award. So. Yeah, I do. I do, and they're, they're still on the wall. And yeah, I, I am. I am proud to have done that early on. Maybe I should have a go and enter another award. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking. It sounds like I should be entering one. I haven't <laughs> yet. So yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, are you in your new studio? Yeah. Dude, yeah. Tell us about it. A little tour. Um. There's a, a joiner in Gloucester called David Kenyon who built it for me over the summer. Um, it's it's quite big. It's a cabin in the garden um, and it's really well insulated and it's got really good lighting. Um, and it it feels like a culmination of 10 years of work to be able to pay for a building <laughs> to exist in. And I just love coming in here. Sorry, my watch is going off. I love coming in here in the morning um, and opening the blinds and it's, it's beautifully painted. And I, I mean, up until I think it was October, I moved into here. I was working in a dining room. So every time I needed to change processes, once I'd done one section of a job, I would have to tidy everything up again to make enough space to do the next process. And I was completely overwhelmed with it. It was piled high and I, I can hardly believe how I managed in a dining room when now I have this massive space and I have storage and a proper workbench and things. It's, it's glorious. It feels like I've made it. <laughs> You've got your own, your own place. And the family are thrilled because I'm no longer taking over the dining room. <laughs> yeah. Ah, that's got to be the best feeling. I think that's why a lot of people like to get offices or, or whatever. And yeah, I'm not crazy about the idea of getting an office exactly because I'm such an introvert. I'm quite happy working at home on my own. But, um, but yeah, definitely having a separate dedicated space would be awesome it's, it's better for mental health i think to to uh to not see you work constantly um i felt yeah, a lot better since yeah. since having it yeah and i see you've painted it as your brand color you've been through a rebranding at some point maybe even more than one once what was that yeah was it was it as as horrible as I imagine? Well, I would imagine it. If you're not a graphic designer, it probably is quite horrible. Well, yeah, um, it's not that. I mean, you know, I would just get get a new logo designed. Yeah, that be straightforward. But it's it's replacing everything everywhere and making sure you remembered all the things. Yeah, I know what you mean. I it's something that I've always struggled to spend time on my own branding that pro ideally I probably need to spend 20 or 30 hours just working on my own branding but at no point have I had 20 or 30 hours to just work on my own branding so I never feel like I've properly gone through the process and I've, I've gone through the branding process with lots of other people um I'm I'm doing some work for someone at the moment on branding and I've done it properly from scratch with the research and the sketches and the ideas and I've never properly done that for myself. So the, the logo that I have, I do like it, but I, I don't feel that I've properly explored 
what I could do. And I don't, I don't feel like I've properly completed my own branding process, which is an appalling thing to say for a graphic designer that I, I don't feel like I've got a proper brand set up yet. Um, and it was 2018 that I did that logo. Um, so I'm probably due for a new one <laughs> at some point. Um, Already? I, I don't want to think about having to go through this every four years. <laughs> It's, well, it's a lot easier when when you're not having to pay somebody else to do it. Um. Well, and the thing is, I quite like my logo. <laughs> I do, I do like. I love your your branding. I think it's really, really good. Um, but my own, I, I do I, I, get to the point where I get bored of it, and I I think I could do better than that now, and I want it to reflect what I'm able to do now. Um, so at yeah, some point sense. I probably will redo it. Um, but I'll always stick to the blue because it's my favorite color. Um. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've experienced copyright theft of your work. Can you tell us about it? What happened? How did you find out? How did you feel? What did you do about it? And has yeah. it had any ongoing effect? Co copyright is something I know quite a lot about because when I was working for Star Cutouts, I was the design manager and I was designing things using licensed products. So we held licenses with Disney and BBC and Warner Brothers and Lucas and Man United. So I, I had a very good understanding of copyright and an awful lot of people don't understand copyright. Um, but I I do protect my own copyright quite carefully. I'm quite nervous about it. Um, but I on Etsy, I have a, a, a section of the shop where people can buy access to digital templates um, using a, another service. So some of my older designs that I'm no longer selling in the shop in order to carry on making them available and to carry on making a bit of money from them, I have them available as digital designs, but I make it very clear that they are for personal use. They're for people who are having a, a budget wedding and want to make their own stationery. Um, but the the person who, who uh, stole the design, it was some wedding planners and I'd been doing a, a a research hour looking at Etsy, looking at what's there, um, just so just so I know what what is available. So I don't I don't have a lot of time to look at Etsy, but it is something that all Etsy sellers should do from time to time to have a look at the market and make sure that you're not missing a trend. So I was having a look what is available in the travel category in wedding stationery and there I saw my design really badly made and the pictures that they'd taken of what they'd made was just shocking and I don't know what they were thinking and I, I very much doubt anyone bought it because it looked awful um, but it was very clearly my design because when you paint your own stuff there is no doubt <laughs> you know it was it was my pictures that they were using um, and I did a lot of research in who they were and where they'd sold it. I even know who it was they sold it to because they bought it and sold it to one of their customers. Um, they were they were a bit shoddy. But anyway, I contacted Etsy and Etsy sided with me straight away. Um, and I had all the original pictures. If Etsy had said, well, we don't know, we're not sure, I would have been able to show them the original sketchbooks of of the images that were taken but I did feel very violated and very upset um, and I, I thought how can people not understand that that's not okay I, yeah. I mean these women I, did they think that that was that that was acceptable did they not understand that a human being has created that for a purpose and that and I I think it's really not understood that if you take something that someone else has made and try and make a profit from it, that's 
the breach of copyright. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to educate people about it when I see people on social media saying, I've, I've been dinged by Etsy for selling Disney products. And I, I've explained to many, many people, you're not allowed to do that because it's not yours. You don't own it. Um, but I, it's, it's one of those bits of law that I think a lot of people don't understand. And they think that it's a victimless crime. And it's not. It's a person at the end of the computer um, that you've stolen something from. And I bet these people wouldn't go into a shop and pick something up off a shelf and steal it. And yet they think it's OK to do that. But, yeah, I, I think it's something people need to be very aware of. Um, um, well, and to change the subject <laughs> entirely... <laughs> Entirely, um, something nicer. <laughs> you do graphic design, sewing, silver jewelry making, lino cutting, oil painting, watercolor painting, charcoal drawing, and more. And I'm exhausted already. <laughs> Is there anything you um, haven't yet tried that you would love to try in the in the creative? To, to be fair, all of those things, I'm not a specialist in most of those things. No, when, you're a, when you're a crafty person, you like making things, you do like to have a go at stuff because you kind of look at things and go, I could do that, I could do that. Um, so many of those things I've had a go at, but things like lino cutting, I love lino cutting, but I've hardly had any time to do it. And if if we had another lockdown and I didn't have a six-year-old to look after, I think I'd spend the whole time practicing lino, but I don't have the time. Um, likewise with oil painting, I, I've i barely had any time to do it, so I, I'm i not very good at it. But I think the thing that I'd really like to have a go at one day, which is probably too hard, is leather. I'd really like to work with leather um, or hats. I like hats. I'd like to make hats or make purses out of leather. Um, I, I bought a beautiful purse from an Etsy seller in Greece, I think, um, years ago. I had a really, really good April and I made more money than I'd ever made ever on Etsy. And I was just amazed at how well I'd done. And my husband said, give yourself a bonus because you deserve it. And I went on Etsy and I, got this guy in Greece to make me this beautiful purple leather purse with floral lining and it was gorgeous and and every time I use it it's it's a handmade piece and it feels soft and and the edges feel perfect and I just I just think that must be so lovely to to work in leather and to make bags and purses and things like that so there you go that's what I like to do <laughs> tangible reminder of your uh, awesomely good month so yeah yeah I, I that's something that you never do when you're not working for yourself as a teacher you never you never have a bumper month and think I deserve something and that was really early on and my husband was like you can't do this all the time but sometimes you need to acknowledge that you've had a good month and and have something and and celebrate it and giving that money to another Etsy seller in Greece to make me something nice seemed like the nicest way to to celebrate the good month um, yeah excellent I love it <laughs> um so speaking of fellow makers do you follow anybody in the making space who particularly inspires you yeah I've, I do follow a lot of people um I obviously follow a lot of wedding stationery companies and graphic designers, um, as well as lots of other makers. There's um, a designer called Foxglove Press, um, and I, I think that she's in Yorkshire, and she makes she makes wedding stationery and, and other prints from etchings. Um, but she has a very similar, she likes nature. She, she does lots of wildflower, leaves and, and grasses and 
um, and they're all done with dry point etching, which is another thing that I, I do know how to do because I did it at school. Um, but I follow her partly because I like her work and also her social media is brilliant. She's really, really good at live videos and I, I just think it's so creative. So that's, that's one of them. And there's somebody called um, Pingle Pie who is a wedding stationer. And again, I think she's probably inspired by similar things to me, but her, the quality of her painting is far, far ahead of me. And when I look at her paintings, it makes me go, I need to improve my paintings. <laughs> I'm not as good as her. And I, I watch her process and think she is someone to aspire to. I don't know what she's called. No idea what her name is. Um, um, glad that it has that effect on you but i just have to insert here again because i am your number one fan yes, you are. Yeah, you are amazing and awesome and lovely <laughs> <laughs> True, truly sincerely all, all designers are like this all, all of them i bet i bet the lady at pingle pie probably feels the same that she probably thinks one day i'll be as good as as somebody else that i haven't seen yet but it's important to look at what else is happening and what other people are doing because you don't want to be in an echo chamber and you don't improve if you don't look at what else there is and and how other people are refining things and graphic designers are always looking at layouts and font pairings and following people I can often see oh that's a really good way of, of of combining those fonts and I hadn't thought about that and then back to the copyright thing it is important that you don't look at it and go I'm going to replicate what they've just done but sometimes designers look at other designers and they it just it make they make a mental note of they've done something there that hadn't occurred to me and I can do something similar um but that, I was taught to do that at college <laughs> Um, yeah absolutely so um i always like to ask when you're working through problems in your work who do you talk to as a solo um well before the pandemic i had someone working with me who you know kelly um so i used to ask kelly if, if i was struggling with how to deal with an inquiry kelly's really good at writing and she often would write the emails because she's so good at, at writing, but Kelly isn't working for me anymore. Um, so these days, I ha Paula, who I did the wedding station before all those years ago, um, she runs a business from her house in North Wales. She makes dried flower gifts and, and beautiful arrangements. Um, and she's working alone as well. So all day long, we message each other with, the things that are occurring and the, the problems we're having and, you know, expressions about how much things are costing and the problems with Etsy, all sorts of things. But she's effectively a colleague in another room who sends me, you know, messages all day long. And that's, that's probably who I, who I ask. And she asks me the same things. It's, you do need somebody. It, it can be lonely working alone and not having anyone to help you solve problems. Um, but I, I think a lot of makers probably have another business friend somewhere who they, they share things with. Um, that's, that's good. Yeah, I, I have um, a business friend of mine also in North Wales. <laughs> um, we're not messaging I think maybe as much as you, but definitely sharing our, our frustrations and our wins. Yeah, you do need somebody to share the wins with and the frustrations. Yeah. Otherwise, you're dancing around by yourself. <laughs> no one to share it with. <laughs> I mean, you know, I could do that, but. <laughs> so, um, what do you have coming up that you're excited about? Um, do you mean in the business? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, well, I've just, I've just, um, I've just joined Not on the High Street, um, and it, it feels like 
being right at the back, the beginning of Etsy. I'm just taking my jacket off. It, it feels like being at the beginning of a business, getting on on the high street. That there's so much to do to get everything on there. So I'm I'm trying to get something on every day to build up the range because it's it's quite there's a lot of admin getting things on to not on the high street. Um, but I'm I'm trying to launch new things to go on there. So in the past week, I've launched the beginning of sunflowers and the beginning of press flowers. Um, and I need to keep going with those and complete them all and, and put them up. Um, and then after that, I think I'm going to look at winter because I haven't done anything for winter weddings for quite a while. And I do have some graphics that I've not properly used I have stacks and stacks of graphics that I've not not properly used, but I'm I'm going to try and get an autumn winter range up, um, hopefully in time for something. Um, yeah, you've got to think so far ahead okay. like, with winter yeah. with wet things, don't you? Yeah, I'm often behind. I'm often months and months behind. Well, that means months and months ahead of the next one. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. It does. You always catch it later on. It's you know. Um. Okay, so this has been great. Where can the audience find you online? Um, www.paperwillow.com is my own website, um, and I think that's the easiest place to order from. But also Etsy. Um, not on the high street. Um, I do have a few things on Amazon, but I've kind of given up on Amazon. Um, so I'm sticking to those three mainly. It's yeah. um, oh. <laughs> my alarm now. Um, thank you so, so much for coming on. And um, I always like to end with this question. How do you know when a piece is finished? Um, my thing's going off. Um, how do I know when a piece is finished? A lot of my designs take many, many months of me having ideas and doing sketches and then putting them away and forgetting about them and then going back to them and going, oh, that's all wrong. and having another go and usually I then launch something when I can see that if I don't launch it I'm never going to launch it so I wouldn't say that anything was ever completely finished because I, I am a bit of a one for changing things even after I've launched it and things like the the wildflowers collection um every few months I add more flowers to it because I keep painting more wildflowers that people ask me to do and thinking, oh, a little bit of yellow would, would go in there. So then I redo the whole collection and reprint it and re-photograph it. And so I'm not sure if anything ever is completely finished, but the, probably the main thing is I think if I don't get this made and on the internet, I will never make any money out of it. And that's usually the pressure that makes me go, it may not be perfect, but it has to go. It has to get out there and I'll sort it out later. So things like this one, it's only got one animal on it at the moment. The original plan was it was going to have lots of animals on it. But I ran out of time because things got really busy and I wanted to launch it. So at some point I will go back and add more animals to this collection. <laughs> It's it's not very organised, but that's how I work. <laughs> but that's that's why I ask because I want the real answer. Yeah, that's the real answer. <laughs> actually, in the trenches doing it because I, um, so writing is what I usually struggle with finishing. But yeah, and and I I it's never finished, and I will constantly tweak it. And if I have access to, if I haven't like put it in an envelope and sent it away yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have access to it if it's on my website or something i will just constantly be editing it so yes this is part of why i ask is to try to get partners for myself <laughs> but thank you so much my phone is about to die so um <laughs> this has been really really great i've loved yeah, really good. hopefully we'll meet the real one day <laughs>
Hopefully, yes. <laughs> and this is Jacqueline of Paper Willow, and I am Sarah Jane of Amethyst Raccoon. She does stationery, and I do bookkeeping. And if you want more um, community of makers and artisans, please come join my Facebook group, Handmade Business Club UK. And um, y'all yeah, have a fantastic evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Cocktails and Chat, the podcast for building community among makers and artisans. If you'd like to continue the chat, please do join us in the Facebook group Handmade Business Club UK or join my mailing list at amethystraccoon.com slash newsletter. For the show notes with all the places to find Jacqueline, please visit amethystraccoon.com slash cc7. If you liked this episode, please leave a rating or review. It really does help. Until next time, happy making and cheers! <laughs>